Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel. A non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. And I have with me today in the studio a Mr. James Jarvie, who we are so used to calling Jarvie that that's what I'm going to call him. Jarvie, welcome to GV247. And I know you know a lot about us for various reasons. You're part of the team. Yep. Um, Jarvie, I think we've known each other probably since about 2012 when you, it was my cousin, wasn't it? Was one of your best friends and he introduced you to the Daniel Project. Viewers, many of you will know Jarvie from when my husband Stuart married uh, Jarvie to Maria, his beautiful wife, and that was in December. So, hello Maria, say hello to your wife. (laughs) Okay, Jarvie. We're going to be talking about um, a trip you did to Nepal. Sure. But first of all, I think a lot of people would be interested in knowing a little bit about you because you are also well known around the world for playing a particular part in a movie. So just tell us a little bit about how you came to the Lord because apparently you were some kind of fighter. I became a Christian about nine years ago, April 2009. Mm-hmm. And it was, a, I lived in quite a crazy life. It was, I was involved in mixed martial arts. I was involved in jiu-jitsu, Thai boxing, boxing, I was a bouncer, so my life was pretty much revolved around fighting. And so to become a Christian, it was quite a change of lifestyle, to say the least. But when the Lord calls you... So in other words, Jarvie, you were a bit of a hard man, possibly. No. No, you were a sweetie inside. Okay. So it's wonderful. You're gloriously saved. You've turned your back on that now. So we're going to just take a wee trip to Nepal, where you went. How long ago did you go there? Yeah, about 18 months ago. Yeah, that was in 2016, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, Jarvi, um, first of all, why did you go there? What uh, What was it all about? What was the trip about? Well, the trip was a, a research trip to see if we could take missionaries out there to preach the gospel to places that hadn't been reached. Mm-hmm. And our hope was to go to Bhutan, mm-hmm. but we, we laid that before the Lord, and we went to Nepal, and then we hoped the Lord would lead us into Bhutan, but it never quite happened. And so we decided to go, we asked advice from locals where the gospel hadn't been preached from local Christians. And they directed us, directed us to a mountain village mm. that no missionaries have been there. Wow. But but t- you found out that wasn't true. Yeah, typically, I don't think there are many places that have never had a, a missionary. Did you hear from the Lord about going? I mean, I remember the church praying, praying mm. for you. But uh, you were given another encouragement, weren't you? I was in Israel uh, a few months previous mm-hmm. with my friend Marcus. We were taking photographic sh- uh, shots of archaeological sites for the Lamplight Project and mm-hmm. different scenes around about Israel, around Nazareth and Galilee and Capernaum. And Marcus was very blessed to see the different parts of Israel we hadn't seen before and to hear some of the history of Israel. And so he questioned me that I, sh- I need to go. In fact, he commanded me, I must go and preach the gospel to the unreached people groups. And my answer was simple, that I said, I will go when the Lord sends me. And he, this, this debate lasted about 30 minutes and we both gave up in the end. We weren't winning, winning each other over and we went into the prayer room to pray. And after two and a half hours, a woman walked up to me before I left the prayer room and said, the Lord wanted me to give you this. And on the piece of paper was a scripture from Romans, Mm -hmm. and it was Romans 10, 14. And it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Mm. And as soon as I read that, I just looked up and said, okay, Lord, I'll go. (laughs) And within a few months, we were in Nepal. Um, So you hired bikes. Yeah, we hired bikes Uh and we just really, that day, we just trusted that the Lord, we had a free day and just trusted the Lord would take us somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was was quite dangerous on these roads, but we knew that the Lord had sent us for a reason Mm -hmm. and we'd be okay. Okay, what are you riding here just for any bike enthusiasts? Oh, this is a Royal Enfield. Mm-hmm. And they a used British to be, bike? It used to be. Uh-huh. They're now made in India. All oh, right. And they've made a bad bike even worse. <laughs> okay, so you stopped, you had something to eat, and off you go. You're back along the path. Yeah. 
we did manage to uh, we bumped into a guy and he mm. invited us back to his house right. and we took the opportunity to go into his house to preach the gospel and mm-hmm. and he responded and he made a confession of faith in the Lord and he, he allowed us to pray for his wife who was mm-hmm. having trouble with her, her back and her knees mm-hmm. and she said they felt much better after the prayer and it, a lot of the pain had gone Great. so that was a real witness for both of them mm-hmm. And a, a few days later, we got to meet up with this guy again. He mm-hmm. came to meet us, and we got to give him a Bible in Nepalese, and we got to pray for him. So we need to keep him in our prayer. And That's amazing. Um, their, their houses are fairly... Um, they're not luxurious. They're nowhere, you know, like we're used to. Um, could you tell us a wee bit, what kind of dwellings are these people living in? This house the here Nepalese is a, in particular. This house in particular mm-hmm. is a very good house. Mm-hmm. You can see it's it's quite dilapidated, but mm-hmm. as compared to other it's got other real houses, walls it's, and a real roof. yeah, it's, uh-huh. and it's got a few floors and it's got a balcony. Mm-hmm. So this would be considered a very good house. Mm-hmm. And at this moment, we can see Magnus giving them the gospel. Mm-hmm. So on the right, the man who's speaking just now. Yeah, this is my friend Magnus. who mm-hmm. have been a missionary for many years. Um, Jarvie, these are lovely shots of the mountains. So you're saying there's consequences, Jarvie. Um, first of all, what about missionaries? Are you allowed to go into Nepal and proselytise? No, this is illegal in, in Nepal. Right. And what could happen to you? You could spend years in prison. Really? I think it's unlikely that a Western missionary would end up in prison. I think it's more likely they would be deported mm-hmm. because of an international crisis. But I think it's more enforced by the Indian government mm-hmm. who are trying to bring political measure for their own control. And for mm-hmm. they want to they want to control Nepal. They've even shot off. At the time we were there, they made a roadblock to stop mm-hmm. petrol coming into Nepal, mm-hmm. and the queues were so long to fuel their bikes up. And so they're trying to implement Hinduism as much as they can, probably because of the caste system Mm -hmm. that will benefit them more. Right. So what about these souls? Are they they mainly Buddhist? Are they Hindu? I mean, they look fairly, you know, Buddhist and the typical um, lifestyle. Yeah. Especially in the mountains, they come... uh, You'll see a lot of Buddhist culture. They've got a Lama that mm-hmm. come and visit them periodically to make yeah. sure they're doing what they're meant to be doing mm-hmm. and to make collections mm-hmm. because people give to the Lamas. Yes. Yeah. And they're very strict. Now, um, Jarvi, you would have realised when you went over there, I remember we had a chat about this, that the root of Buddhism is actually Hinduism. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't know that. Um, yeah. But also, what's going to happen to the people if they... A, speak to Christians, or B, actually become converted? Well, it depends on what area you're in. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're in Kathmandu, you can be ostracised from your family. If you're in the mountain village, you may have to leave the village. Mm-hmm. And we actually heard about a couple of people who did give their life to Jesus, and that afternoon they were killed. Mm-hmm. So different areas, it really comes under the... The, the village leaders on how mm-hmm. they execute their judgment on people. Mm-hmm. So, again, we have another fallacy where so many people in the West think of Buddhism as a real religion of peace. And yes, it's an essential part of it, but mm-hmm. we also know that um, some of the, the greatest fighters and warriors actually come from that area. Um, I'm not just thinking of the Gurkhas and so on, but um, the Nepalese is actually the Buddhist themselves who who are fine warriors uh, mm. th- their own particular armies so what did, what did you find with this is this a dilemma for you yeah well i think i think people relate buddhism as a peaceful religion mm-hmm. but what i what i seen was something very different and when when they feel a threat from christianity or jesus mm-hmm. then you will see the true buddhism or true spirit coming out in them mm-hmm. and there have been missionaries chased out of village uh, missionaries chased out of villages mm-hmm. with stones thrown at them missionaries being beat up you can see a uh, our translator was terrified the mm-hmm. whole time he was he was so nervous about preaching in the village mm-hmm. now i think didn't you have a problem with this jarvie um you heard the translator saying the word christian quite yeah. frequently and you realized that because 
sharing the gospel um, and for somebody to become a Christian is a no-no. Yeah. So you asked him to put it another way. What did you ask him to do? Yeah, we, we realised pretty quickly that every time the translator said the word Christian, mm-hmm. people would become defensive and nervous mm-hmm. and they would try and shut down the conversation. Yeah. And so we realised that quickly, and we, but we didn't say the word Christian to the translator. Mm-hmm. So we asked him, and we found it pretty quickly the lamas had warned them you do not become Christian they didn't warn them not to listen to stories of Jesus or to become followers of Jesus uh-huh. they just said do not become Christian mm-hmm. and this was a warning from the lama mm-hmm. so we asked the translator don't mention the word Christian mm-hmm. just ask them would you like to hear the story of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. but he persisted on saying Christian and it turned into quite an argument at one point uh-huh. but we but that, that's a lovely way to put it, Jarvie, to, to ask the people would they like to hear the story of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's that's inventive. And, and the response mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. one of excitement to hear because they're in Nepal they've got a very oral culture. They like mm-hmm. to hear stories. Mm-hmm. So they were they're excited to hear the story, who's mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Let me tell you. These high mountains, they're the Himalayas, I believe. So yeah. you were pretty high up. You don't know how many feet. but no. um, And these people are praying very earnestly. Look at the, the little one with his eyes, or his or her eyes screwed yeah. shut. Um, obviously, prayer is a, a very large part of the life of a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever. Yeah. But uh, the fact that they received it so openly and so earnestly must have been an encouragement, Jarvie, is that right? Yeah, it was a, it was a great encouragement. Mm-hmm. This was at the, the halfway point to the village we were going to, so mm-hmm. it was a great encouragement mm-hmm. to have such a response so early on. Yeah. And yeah, they were, they were excited to hear and receive the word. Mm-hmm. But we had previously told they were a church that was demolished in the earthquake, I think it was, mm-hmm. and there were plans to bring that church back. Mm-hmm. So I think they had received some teaching, mm-hmm. but they were they had this desire to know more. So when we preached, they wanted to give their lives. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost like they didn't have that opportunity before the church was destroyed. Right. And find, then someone else came in, and they've got this opportunity again. Wow. And so they didn't want to miss it. Mm-hmm. So we led them in prayer and we were told that, that there is plans to bring this church back. So we keep them in our prayer. Um, now, Jarvie, you're lifting here some wood. Uh, what's happening? Are we building a house? Yeah, we were, mm-hmm. we were just passing by and these people were building, we were trying to put the roof back on their house because oh, right. it had blown off with bad weather. Oh, so we took the opportunity to just get involved and help them mm-hmm. and use that opportunity to give them the gospel. Wonderful. And share the love of Christ. And, oh, that's beautiful. But mm-hmm. they were pretty nervous mm-hmm. to, to, to listen mm-hmm. and they were unresponsive. Right. They were scared because the warnings from the lamas right. and you could tell that they were nervous mm-hmm. they wanted the blessing mm. they just didn't want the prayer right i get it i understand um any other stories um what about this this guy in the orange here now i think you mentioned to me earlier was he not um the leader was or an elder of the village yeah. tell us all about him this guy was a former leader of mm-hmm. the village yeah and he was he had some serious illness and he had severe stomach pain, mm-hmm. and he went to a doctor, and mm-hmm. the doctor didn't couldn't diagnose him with anything. Right. And so he went to a witch doctor, mm-hmm. and they couldn't help him either. Mm-hmm. And a travelling missionary was passing through, and the missionary p- prayed for him, mm-hmm. and he was healed wow. Praise God. dramatically. Mm-hmm. And he said he knew it was Jesus Christ that healed him, which is amazing because... I think in these cultures, you can look to the person and say, this person healed me. But this guy knew it was Jesus Christ. Mm. And so he gave his life to the Lord. And when he heard that some Christian missionaries were in the village, he came straight down to to be look for encouragement and prayer. Mm-hmm. Because from what I hear, he stands up there faithfully opposing the lamas and telling the lamas wow. that Jesus is the only way. And he was the only Christian in the village. Yeah. Then. And he, he only he's only allowed to remain in the village because mm-hmm. his son is now the leader. And so... He's allowed his father to stay. Yeah, that was one of the great encouragements in Nepal that Mm -hmm. there's some amazing people doing such great things. Mm -hmm. And it's it's great just to meet your brothers and sisters and you can recognise them. They've got this love for the Lord, not for themselves or for any materialistic Mm -hmm. stuff. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's all about Jesus. Wonderful. Mm. Um, Any other adventures uh, in Nepal? Is there anything else you'd like to share? 
Yeah, we, we went to a, a Nepalese church. We were invited by a pastor wow. who invited us to his, his church mm-hmm. and they're doing amazing things. And one of the greatest encouragements was when I walked into the church, mm-hmm. I looked and everyone had a Bible and they were all following all the scriptures in the, in the, in the sermon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, I thought it was such a, a polarisation from mm-hmm. the UK when you walk into a church. No one has a Bible anymore. Well, you've been going to the wrong churches. They do in our church, Jarvie. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Because as, you know, we're living in those days where there is the great apostasia falling away from the faith and to be able to go to Nepal and actually see Christians there who are indeed yeah, reading the word. That is exciting. The last time we saw Jarvie on this programme was a few weeks ago when you saw the photograph of him baptising his Mm brother-in-law, Carlo. Tell us a wee bit about that. Yeah, it was uh, an an amazing honour to bless Mm -hmm. Carlo and just encourage him to be part of his baptism, Mm -hmm. part of his commitment to the Lord. It was amazing. And you don't have to say the country, but it was in the sea, wasn't it? It It wasn't a river. It was in the sea. Yeah. It was wonderful. What about your own experience, though, Jarvie? I mean, how long did you have to wait till you got baptised well, in water? Like because ha- Carlo had been a Christian for quite a while, hadn't he? Yeah, it? about five years. Yeah. And I think we're both victims of the modern day church where baptism, the importance of baptism isn't taught, mm. nor are you encouraged to get baptised. When, mm. I, when I gave my life to the Lord, I wanted to be baptised on that day. And I asked the pastor, when can I be baptised? And he said, oh, I don't know. I don't know when the next baptism service is. And I was so disappointed. Mm. I had to wait six months to be baptised. And when I went to to see my wife's brother, he was talking about baptism. And he Mm. told me that the day before I got there, him and his wife were discussing the importance of baptism. And when I got there, I I encouraged them. It's Mm -hmm. what a wonderful thing to do. And I says, it's a command from the Lord, repent and be Mm baptised. And I sent him the, the scripture from Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the eunuch. And then he turned to me and says, OK, I want baptised. It's a great story. Jarvie, um, you know, you're talking about being a victim of the modern day church. So that particular church and where you couldn't get baptised, um, would they take the bread and the wine every week? Is that, no. That, no. No, no. No, I think I was, in the, I was in the church for maybe four years mm-hmm. and I took the bread and the wine no more than three times. So it was only offered about three times in yeah. those four years. Uh, what part of the Bible do people not understand when it says as often as you meet together? Yeah. It's very sad and it certainly is a reflection on the modern day church. So you did get baptised f- um, a few years ago. How long ago was it? Yeah, it was 2009, September. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, so that, and your wife's baptised and her brother's baptised. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, have well, you any other stories? I mean, I think about... I, I think this baptism a uh, problem. It's not just uh, in the UK. Mm-hmm. When I was in, I was travelling in Israel, taking photos uh-huh. for the Lamplight Project of archaeological sites, and I was I, went, I took my friend Marcus to the River Jordan to show where the Jesus was allegedly baptised. Mm-hmm. And uh, now he was baptised in the Jordan. Yeah, but not maybe At not in this location. Spot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, and so we were driving down to. The, the river of Jordan at this spot and we've seen a guy walking back from the river and I thought man this guy is crazy it's so hot mm-hmm. and he's walking with his backpack on and so me and Marcus spent some time on the river Jordan we mm-hmm. chatted and, and it was a good time and we're driving back and we see this guy again still walking on the motorway mm-hmm. he must have been suffering and so I said to Marcus let's pick him up and we'll, we'll give him the gospel mm-hmm. because I didn't know if he was a Christian or not mm-hmm. And he got in the car and when I started speaking to him, he told me he had just got baptised at the River Jordan. And I thought, wow, amazing, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I says, I said, eh, and I, I made a reference, how long, have you been, how long have you been saved? He says, oh, I've been a Christian 20 years. Oh, my goodness. And I couldn't believe he had been in the church for 20 years mm-hmm. and he just got baptised on that day. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And it, it really started to open my eyes to... What isn't being taught in the church mm-hmm. is is so sad. Mm-hmm. They're missing out on the wonders of God's word and the encouragement that comes with that. Mm-hmm. What other examples do you see of that, Jarvie? Because I know um, you've worked with Stuart and I on um, various projects involved in creation and evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 
what's your experience of that and how did you become interested in it, in the subject? Well, I became interested in apologetics mm. and everything that goes with apologetics because I was always reaching out to people. I was always trying to give people the gospel and I kept hitting a wall every time. Mm -hmm. People would be coming up with things. One day someone would come up with an argument with genetics, some person would come with geology and I thought, man, I need to learn all this stuff. And that just led into a, a, a knowledge of apologetics. But apologetics, like the Bible, isn't being taught in church. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so many problems when these young people from youth groups and and maybe just young people in the church go to university and they can't answer the questions. They, they, they do not know how to defend their faith. Mm -hmm. And it's sad. And these people are being slaughtered in the world. And a lot of people are turning their back on their faith and rejecting the church because they're not being armed with the information mm -hmm. they need. You obviously feel very passionately about this, Jarvie. Um, where can people go to learn apologetics? Well, our very own Lamplight Project, mm -hmm. GV247, mm -hmm. Answers in Genesis, Creation Research Ministries, the Creation Research Network. There are lo lots of great ministries out there teaching many great things mm -hmm. and they're really good pastors also. How many hours or weeks or months or years of study have you put into this, Charvi? Realistically, uh, I, I couldn't. You couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's your favourite strand to follow then? Your favourite strand of apologetics to follow? Well, right now, what I like the most is I like the biological arguments. Mm -hmm. I enjoy how complex our bodies is, mm -hmm. are uh, just the amazing coding that's in DNA is. And to see it arrive by chance is, is absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's usually, if a conversation goes down the apologetical ro road, then I'll always use that mm -hmm. as a good argument, especially mathematically. Mm -hmm. um, you came with us to film in Kentucky when yep. we went to Answers in Genesis, um, the Noah's Ark and so on. Could you tell the viewers what that was like and... And some of the people you met and your yeah. adventures there. It was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. The ark is incredible. It's, it's sheer size. And mm -hmm. it really opens your eyes to just what a wonderful story the, the, the Noah and the ark is. Mm -hmm. I mean, even walking onto the ark, I just kept thinking the animals went two by two into the ark. And I became so emotional mm -hmm. thinking of just how gracious God is mm -hmm. when you think about everything that was going on and, and how evil man had become that mm -hmm. God still showed his love and his kindness to keep us, to keep us into, can, yeah, to, to bring that family yeah, of to eight. Bring that eight and, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Um, what did you think of, what did you think of the, of the ARC exhibition that they've done there? I mean, it was, it was, in, it was just enormous, wasn't it? No, it was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was truly amazing. And the information and the apologetics all through the ARC and the teaching I mean, it's not just a, a go and a go and ex, a go and experience something mm -hmm. like you go and experience a, a fun park. Mm -hmm. You're learning all the way through, and you're building your apologetical, yeah. biblical. It's really inspiring, mm -hmm. and it's great to see people with such a heart to to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. We also went to the AIG, the Answers in Genesis Creation mm -hmm. Museum at their, their headquarters in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think of that, Jervy? Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. It's a great place to take your family. Mm -hmm. If you want to educate your children to inspire them, it's, it's great for all ages, mm -hmm. from, from the kids to adults. They're great teaching and workshops. It's, it's just a great place.
Jarvi, have you um, have you watched the Lamplight Project? I have. Yeah. Five times. Okay. What do you think of the Lamplight Project? I think it's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Have you managed to use it with anybody yet? No, I've given a few copies to a lot of people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they've all came back with amazing reports. I've been mm -hmm. so blessed by it mm -hmm. and uh, I'm continually blessed by it. I think... Um, I think we also showed our viewers you and Johnny, mm -hmm. one of your best friends who's also in our church, down at the Answers in Genesis mega conference. Mm -hmm. Remember doing that? Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to thank you again, you know, on behalf of Stuart and I and, and you know, the whole team just for being a part of it, Jarvie. Mm -hmm. Jarvie's just got such a heart to see people saved. Jarvie, thank you very, very much for coming to the studio and I'm hoping you'll come back again. Of course. Are you sure? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> This is GV247.TV, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world, plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series. A powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on gv247.tv, our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, this film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages we provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. Based loosely on the documentary, The Daniel Connection is a full-length feature film. This fictional thriller incorporates many of the themes promoted through pop culture and social media which affect people on a global scale. Launched at the Cannes Film Festival, The Daniel Connection points the ever-skeptical viewer to search the Bible for answers to life's deepest questions. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, Please do not hesitate to get in touch.